Isabel, what vocal mic should I buy? This has got to be the most common question I'm asked by my students and podcast listeners, hands down. And I get it. Investing in a mic can feel like a big deal. There's so many options to choose from now and everyone you ask will give you a different recommendation. What's a girl to do? And that's why I've created a quick, easy 45 second quiz where you'll be matched with your perfect vocal mic. You'll tell me about your voice, your setup, your needs and your budget and I'll pair you with a vocal mic that's your perfect fit. No more trawling through the internet, scrolling through thousands of online reviews and losing all sense of time and space. And did I mention you'll even receive a free bonus video I recorded in my very own home studio showing you how to position your mic for your best sounding recordings yet. Just go to femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz to take the quiz and get your hands on all of this. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz and get ready to meet your perfect vocal mic. I find talk to be extremely important, not just uh, for sharing ideas and, and building community and developing confidence uh, through how those ideas resonate or, or, or are echoed back or modified and modulated um, and, and how that can, can give somebody a sense of uh, greater self-esteem because it's affirmed and you're no longer isolated, but also through having the opportunity to talk you are able to learn and develop cognitively. Um, so by teaching, that's how I've learned a lot. Um, and by encouraging others to talk about their practice and their work, I feel that that is the very best tool that we have as teachers. Hello and welcome to Girls Twiddling Knobs. My name's Isabel and over the last decade, my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million Spotify streams. I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. Now, before we begin, have you ever connected to a spirit guide? And I don't mean in a Mystic Meg kind of a way, and that reference is probably for anyone born before 1990. I mean your female producer spirit guide. Now, this is the sister from another mister that you should have probably been praying to when feeling a little lost or alone with recording and production. Now, the good news is I've made a fun quiz to help you discover who she is, and it only takes a few seconds. What's waiting for you on the other side? A packed toolkit inspired by your female producer spirit guide herself to inject your recording and production skills with some vibrant energy. Just go to femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz to take the quiz now. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Girls Twiddling Knobs. Now, this week, I'm delighted to be joined by another fabulous guest on the podcast. And it's someone I've actually mentioned before in episode 16. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Liz Dobson. Now, Liz is a National Teaching Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, Director of the Yorkshire Sound Women Network, composer and fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts and a senior lecturer in music technology at the University of Huddersfield. Now Liz's work explores how music technology education can become more diverse and foster collaboration and creativity in more inclusive communities. And if you're listening to this podcast wondering why your own experiences of learning music technology may have been less than inviting or you're an educator yourself looking for ways to flip the script in music technology education, you're going to love this episode. Okay, let's dive in. So, so yes, I'll just invite you to introduce yourself, Liz. Can you tell us a bit about you? Sure, yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm a, a lecturer at the University of Huddersfield, where I teach sonic arts and sound design for picture and that sort of thing, computer-based composition. I've been there since uh, 2007. And uh, as the longest I've stayed in one place, um, my background began really with a music degree. 
uh, which involved a little bit of music technology, such as how to plug in a MIDI keyboard back in 1994, from 94 to wow. 96, 7, 8. Um, I did my master's in music and sound for film and media and very, very quickly managed to get a job um, in lecturing at Scarborough College, which was which then became part of um, the University of Hull. Um, so I was very quickly absorbed in the world of education. And, and the real be benefit of that was having access to recording studios um, and also a network of people as well. The downside of that, as, as I was saying, listening to previous podcasts uh, that you've produced, um, is that if you're surrounded by a lot of high-end equipment, it can raise the bar and make you feel like um, you have to be using the best or very doing things in very particular sort of ways. That's what academia can do, actually, um, can, can give you that sense of uh, perfectionism um, and that it's too, too much sometimes. So being surrounded by all of these studios, all of these facilities, lots of outboard equipment, it, it's sort of stifling, it's a lot. Um, so I worked there for a couple of years, also developed a real a passion for education and watching people grow and, and develop their own passion for music technology and blossom in that field. And then I went to Leeds College of Music and spent three years teaching there. Um, a very wide range of subjects, range, you know, HND, BA, BSc, at Portsmouth University, I taught there for a number of years and eventually ended up at Huddersfield, um, which is, I, I always had my own Huddersfield because it was such a, is such a, contemporary music sort of uh, iconic place um, for exploring sound and music and, and um, not necessarily doing things in the most conventional way but trying to push boundaries and that means that um, it sort of has given me a, a le it's legitimized my interest in, in incorporating that into my teaching so much so that we now have the the sonic arts pathway um, very much mm. embedded into the course so I can really explore that further with the students so which is fantastic that's um, great yeah and um yeah I, I think that you were talking about um you know back in the 90s when you were studying and then you got into music education and you were saying how you know that was really good because then you you get access to all that equipment and I think back then that was, you know, basically that was your route into actually being able to do this stuff because mm -hmm. the technology just wasn't really there as it is now doing it in your own setup, was it? That's right. I mean, I, I remember my first keyboard when I was about eight was a, a, a sort of Hammond air organ. Oh, and that wow. was my first introduction to music technology. It's just a tiny toy, you know, with a, with a little book and you can buy them, you know, the, they don't cost very much these days even now but uh this tiny toy it played chords with certain buttons so you could play melodies and i was interested in how it worked and also i had a cassette player which i could basically bounce one sound of me playing on a piano onto the other cassette and get this build up of noise or record my family in secret um when i was a kid and so that i've always been interested in music technology without really thinking of it as music technology. So I followed a music pathway um, when I realized I could, uh, you know, then you, then we had the eighties and MIDI came along and you could start plugging things together and, and capturing those MIDI recordings, not having to just record them on the piano. Um, things became, it sort of opened up more avenue, more doors for me. Yeah. Um, then then the, where I was, was in North Wales, and I did a brief play placement in the BBC in North Wales. Uh, but of course, uh, you had to speak Welsh. So it was a bit like being deaf and mute um, mm -hmm. in a recording studio environment. So I, I was able, I, you know, I learned a few things, but it was very difficult to progress or, or continue with that. Yeah. Uh, before then going into education and sort of having the best of all of these different worlds education really took over for me it, but also my interest in creativity mm. um, and music technology uh, sort of together became of interest because my, I ended up doing my PhD on understanding the collaborative creative process within music technology and how technology and our, our knowledge of the world and each other mediates the creative process through each moment of a collaboration so that that really is fascinating mm. um, and it led me to really understand how um, I think alluding to something else you mentioned in a previous podcast is that we're not static you know you can't say you're not creative or you're not technical uh, the brain is um, 
the brain is always changing. If you mm. practice something, it will change. You know, if you practice the violin, uh, no matter where you are when you start, your brain is literally changing. It's the same with technology and with with exploring technology and exploring creativity and relationship with that. Um, the the possibility to do something unique is always there. Mm. No matter, no matter how you feel about yourself, that possibility is always there, and it's mediated by your life and your circumstances, your conversation, mm. and what you what you expose yourself to, including what technologies you put in your environment as well. Um, but but your your own creativity definitely is at the heart of all of that. Yeah, um, I totally agree. I'm so so excited to have you on the podcast, Liz, because I just think there's so many resonances with why I set this podcast up. And, you know, how we how and why we decide to embark on a learning journey and how and why we may be put off from embarking on that learning journey as well. I mean, there's so much that I I would love to kind of get into. So I'd I'd love to to kind of pick your brains about what does make a successful or a a productive learning experience and um, and and how do we kind of foster confidence and community and all those things um, mm-hmm. if if even we need them you know we'll get into that but um, I would also love to know I guess what on a personal level what has been your experience of learning technology music technology and um, and even teaching music technology those two things are really uh, those two questions are really closely related to each other mm-hmm. I think that uh, again, when I was doing my PhD, I was, I was learning about child development and, um, you know, how children learn, basically. And, and I came across a chap called Lev Vygotsky, who would say that the that um, um, higher melt, uh, sorry, language is the key to higher mental development. So um, it's a psychological tool. Um, so when a child is processing and talking, um, they're learning. Yeah. So when, when a student is explaining compression, either to me or another student, they're realizing what where they what they do and don't understand, and what they're trying to understand. You get to a window into what resources they have in terms of the language, but also um, they're really exercising themselves mentally to try and get something across, and that through that they're learning. So I find talk to be extremely important, not just. Uh, for sharing ideas and, and building community and developing confidence uh, through how those ideas resonate or, or, or are echoed back or modified and modulated um, and, and how that can, can give somebody a sense of uh, greater self-esteem because it's affirmed and you're no longer isolated, but also through having the opportunity to talk you are able to learn and develop cognitively. Um, so by teaching, that's how I've learned a lot. Yes. Um, and by encouraging others to talk about their practice and mm. their work, I feel that that is the very best tool that we have as teachers, not to focus entirely on what, what students expect to do when they come, which is learn how to make sick beats in, in a door or yeah. whatever the current word is for sick. I'm... I'm old now, so I don't know. Um, yeah, students, I don't think I've ever yeah. used the, the right current words <laughs> for anything I like did. that. I used I used that to uh, mock myself in the class once, and the students loved it. But I often don't have the courage to mock <laughs> myself. I have to yeah. know students really well, yeah, uh, to be able to do that. Um, so I think that talk personally is is the mm. absolute cornerstone and mm. in order for people who are marginalized um or or minority people so if the space is for music technology mm. uh white male homogenous um heterosexual space and and i've been into many studios uh to observe students on placement and some of those studios i've thought this is, I, you know, I don't think I could work in this space because I would feel really shut down by the, the kind of energy that they have mm-hmm. here, this uh, ascribing to uh, celebrating what equipment they have or uh, your knowledge about certain bits of equipment or how much you can lift or not, um, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Um, I think creating environments where people can talk freely, where people are able to take risks, and for those risks to be comfortable and validated are really important. So to, yeah. to get the guitar pedals out and understand how to 
um, how to work them. And in one of the workshops we did last year where we looked at how could we reduce risk in this workshop one one of the participants said maybe we just touch the equipment when it's off you know and some people are nervous mm. about making a lot of noise and I know yeah. my first experience of learning my first uh sort of big mixing desk in a recording studio on my own um back in Scarborough was immediate feedback um and I was relieved that nobody else was there to hear it but it just frightened the <laughs> life out of me oh yeah it's and petrifying you're you, you're like this is so loud I have right. no in in that moment you your brain can just freeze and you just think I have right. no idea of how to stop this somebody stop yeah. it now please 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 and then yeah if there was anyone else in the room you'd be so yeah. ashamed and I'm um, sure that's happened to everybody oh yeah you, yeah you, you definitely don't want that to happen in a class of other students and that feeling stays with you for a really <sighs> long time oh, as well. I know oh it's one of the most I think it's one of the most difficult and um challenging things about teaching that you even if you don't believe in this philosophy or this approach to teaching there is an expectation that you are an expert mm -hmm. and even if you think well actually I don't want there to be that hierarchy and there's so many different genres of music and different types of technology that you may not be aware of because it's just so varied now so mm -hmm. there could be somebody else in the room who's an expert in something you don't know about all of this is very logical and yet still you there is that pressure on you when you're you're holding that space mm -hmm. that you do not mess up like that you know right. and that you do know what you're doing um that's... And of course you do it's uh, the students come with different expectations as to what that expert looks like yeah. and what, what they uh, believe to be uh, expert knowledge, what, what that knowledge yeah. qualifies as. So um, if you don't know a certain door, for example, maybe you're dismissed as not being mm -hmm. the right expert and they, they will immediately make that decision, we'll go somewhere else, then that's fine. Um, they're paying high tuition fees. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can sometimes come back as well as as within that expectation of that they mm -hmm. have onto you, uh, along with their other judgments of mm -hmm. the staff, and uh, they're they're encouraged to evaluate all the time. This must be very stressful for them because they're mm -hmm. constantly trying to justify not only to themselves but to the to their parents maybe as well. You know, I've invested in doing this, and so I I expect a certain quantifiable amount of information. So when when they have to deviate from that to experiment and explore and go and try all the different microphones instead of just be told which one to use, yeah. um, that feels uh, disorientating for them. But I see this like uh, like if you go to the gym and you pay a personal trainer, they will they will give you the framework and then you've got to climb, you've got to do all the work. Mm -hmm. They will they will give you um all the pointers along the way but they're not going to give you all the answers you really have got to do the no. sweating yourself and put in the that's uh, that's so true yeah and i think that a lot of really really high end services it is very much about that it's it's much more about someone giving you accountability mm -hmm. and some reference points to go off and explore from but a lot of the time people you know when people are paying for really really high ticket coaching for example the, the the actual coach is doing very little of the work you know they may be doing about five percent of the actual talking time and the thinking time yeah. and it, it's interesting how the the more money you pay for teaching and you know that's a kind of very high ticket style of teaching the more money you pay the less you're taught really in a uh -huh. funny way you know you, you you have to do a lot of that learning yourself but that's why people come away finding it so profound right because you have done that journey yourself, you you will have learnt so much more right. than if somebody just gave you a blueprint. Exactly, you know? exactly. If you if you if you're told which microphone to use, uh, which processors to use, how do you have the independence and the confidence to explore everything that's available and arrive arrive at something that you're happy with and know what you discarded along the way, which may also be yeah. in other situations. The, the slower path yeah. is. Um, so much richer and more valuable yeah um yeah and it's that confidence that you get when when you have gone through all those different decision making processes and you've made those mistakes and you've made those choices and then you what you get from the other side is actually much more the confidence that you can go through that again on your own yeah, yeah. isn't it and you know that you don't need to be in a degree or an ma and have somebody tell you how to do it anymore That's because true, yeah. 
hopefully hopefully you've you've graduated with um that confidence that that sort of is the benefit of doing a formal course that you can experiment and mm. play with all the facilities that are av- av- mm. available and then if you want to build your own studio you can start to cherry pick what you want to but that mm. that's a, a sort of privilege afforded to the people who get into those spaces in the first place totally which is why the communities where the people who sit outside of those spaces get together are so incredibly important as well to get hands-on equipment. I mean, that's that's what we're doing with the Yorkshire Sound Women Network since it began in 2015, is opening up spaces so people can get their hands on either university equipment or to share equipment or to share knowledge um, mm. and to really experience that sense of, uh, well, belonging to a community as much as learning music technology and being able to be yeah. epic, um, and not continue to feel on the outside of some mythical thing absolutely well maybe you can tell us a little bit about the yorkshire sound women network and what you do and what you've noticed from working in that environment well the yorkshire sound women network began in 2000 in july 2015 um I basically sent out a tweet. I took I took a picture of a PCB with the moon shining through. So a printed circuit board with the moon shining through from the other side because I thought it looked kind of interesting. And I put it on a Twitter, um, instead of a Twitter account and said, you know, the Yorkshire Sound Women Network is going to start on such and such. Oh, wow. Um, who's interested, basically. 16 people came from Bradford, Sheffield, Leeds to Huddersfield to uh, a gaming shop in Huddersfield. They very kindly let us use the basement. Um, and I wanted to to get something off the ground that would bring together the kind of people that I never normally get to meet, you know, and, and create opportunities for people to do what I said before, basically, share, share equipment and address um, and challenge this majority male uh, demographic situation we all introduced ourselves and the kind of backgrounds that people had was very varied as well some were um, working in various aspects of the industry some people were performers some people were studio manager um, others were managing venues others were just curious and wanted to get into music technology in some way and or, or wanted to to do develop some sound design practice you know very varied um, it was very relaxed and we decided to start meeting regularly. Um, so from that point, the Yorkshire Star Women Network became a sort of collective and we, we started talking about how, how the organisation would, would grow. Um, there were various workshops that happened quite quickly. Um, so, for example, uh, Zoe Blade and Nina Richards, who are, they develop um, Stepper Acid, which is a modular synth, um module um and then they have their own modular setup which they tour at synthfest and so on um and they they write music and they're generally exceptionally knowledgeable about music technology and lovely people as well and they they yeah. uh delivered a, a soldering workshop for um for girls and the resources for that are on the website um, and also a, a, a sound synthesis workshop where we pulled out all the old vintage EMS uh, synths out of the studios at Huddersfield. Um, wow. And we had sort of a meeting really often, like every few weeks, we'd have a meeting with a, partic- a particular theme. So, so sound design, there was a, an algo rave session. We managed to get some funding for that. And as time went on and we started to demonstrate that we could deliver, that, that, that there was a hunger for this, that an all women mm-hmm. environment uh, was necessary it started to attract attention and funding and with support from uh, University of Huddersfield eventually we were able to um, employ a development manager and things have really taken off since then uh, right with with I mean the, the reports are on the Yorkshire Sound Women Network website but Heidi Johnson's our development manager and she's done some incredible work along with the directors um, uh, now it's a formal community interest company uh, that's, wow. that's just making a phenomenal difference with with major uh, partners like Sound and Music potentially. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we, we've worked with Sound and Music, obviously University of Huddersfield, Bradford Media Museum, various organisations um, have collaborated with with the Yorkshire Sound Women Network, and most recently that's uh, that work has included uh, Wired, which was. Um, 12 workshops in Doncaster and also in Leeds 
for girls to start learning music technology and that ended up moving online because of covid um, and that's that we're looking to repeat that but also there was an annual um level up series of events where uh professional or semi-professional women at the beginning of their career could come together and, and develop skills and learn new skills um yeah there, there are reports on the website there's a lot to go at yeah um, and to see. that's wonderful well um if somebody wants to go and find out more about the yorkshire sound women network where should they go liz yorkshiresoundwomen.com um, great okay well i will put a link to that in the show notes and um and is that just for women in yorkshire or can you participate if you're not in yorkshire too generally the events are for women and girls and uh gender non-binary um minority gender people in yorkshire um there have been contacts from people wanting to set up things outside of yorkshire so for example we have a malta sound women network group um uh so they they've done a series of it, events they took our const we had to start with the constitution so they took our constitution and developed it and set up their own which is a, a linked group to the yorkshire sound women network mm. affiliate um and so we we help others who want to set something up locally where we can uh but because yeah. of the way the funding streams work that focus tends to be on yorkshire that said there yeah. are resources online which anybody can use so there's a resources page like yeah it's just a tab at the top um, and if you scroll down there, there are, there are well, you could see the, the sound synthesis basics, noise, soldering a noise instrument workshop. So there are workshops that you could use to. Very cool. Up. And then there's, there's a whole collection of uh, things that people have recommended at events, um, like the Standard Issue podcast, for example, Make, Make Electronics mm -hmm. by Charlotte Platt, uh, sorry, Charles Platt, you know, lots and lots of things uh, to dive into um, on the website. That's really good. Um, okay, cool. We'll definitely link to that in the show notes. So I, I'm interested, um, you know, obviously you have that experience of more traditional higher education, but you've also then been um, involved in setting up this female only space. What What are the differences that you've noticed then? Um, well, I, I mean, the first difference is who the demographic is, you know, every, every year students mm. come along and you, you see it's predominantly 18 year old guys. Um, so, you know, that's obviously the, the first key difference. And um, their expectations are that they're on a university degree um, and they have everything that going on for them, like moving away from home. So th that's a, there's that. Um, then when you set up events for women and girls, those are two different things, obviously. So setting up events for women, uh, you can bring together people with a very diverse range of backgrounds and skills. So the students who come onto the course have very similar well, I say similar, it can be incredibly diverse, actually, in terms of their mm -hmm. level and background, but even more so when you set up an event for, for women. Um, so you, you may mm. have people there, some, some people who are visual artists who um, have never worked with sound before, and you may have others who are real experts in the same room. Mm. Um, and what that affords is, is uh, a degree of humility, um, I really apologise for the cat. Don't worry, it's, I can't hear it <laughs> okay, very much. Okay, actually, brilliant. So yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's very, very, very faint. If I let her in, she'd be on my shoulder and bullying me. The other one's just down here <laughs> quietly. Um, yeah. So if you have such a diverse range of skill and you set up the tone of that space to be inclusive and remind people that there is that range of backgrounds um the, it comes with a sense of humility and people are i find generally very welcoming and patient and keen to support each other and to support mm. the idea of uh any questions are possible now it's important i think and what we've done is to say when a session is for beginners for intermediate or for advanced and to give some quantifiable way for people to work out where they sit um, because if somebody's traveling some distance and they, they sit down and they realize that this is very much an entry-level session but that you know they wanted to get into the meat of something else you, yeah. you have to set up the expectations carefully uh, but the lovely thing there is um is, there is a real strong sense of energy for supporting uh other women and for people to to be celebrating being in an environment where you're not you're not a minority in most cases mm -hmm. anymore um mm -hmm. 
that's not exclusively the case, but in most cases you can enjoy not being a minority anymore. Um, and suddenly that that can open up the possibility to talk about those experiences of uh, discrimination, be they uh, quite small, but like a dripping tap enough to take somebody out of the industry completely because they're just tired of it through to yeah. extreme uh, sexism and, and the rest of it. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it does give people a chance to, to resonate with each other. Um, mm. I visited um, a number of collectives in North America, including uh, the Seraphim Collective, um, Beats by Girls, Erin Barra's uh, work, various others. Um, and what really struck me was this idea from Liz Mulvey uh, of um, the Muse Mentor. So um, if you think about the music industry as being full of mentors and students, there's a hierarchy. But in these spaces, there's something like, I think something different happening where the person mm -hmm. who comes into this space um, who feels like they don't bring anything, they, they feel like they don't bring anything because they are a novice. Actually, mm -hmm. um, they are a sort of muse mentor for the others who are already in that space, um, who may be feeling that they, they have a certain degree of knowledge, but they recognize there's a resonance between, they recognize where that person's at and it helps them mm -hmm. to stay connected with that. Um, so yeah. that so there are people in these collectives all over the world, and there are many of them who have a, a very loud voice, who are interacting with people who are still coming in with these stories and, uh, experiences and concerns and um, lack of opportunity and they're hearing this they're resonating with this um, and they care about it and want to do something so the collective yeah. the collective is buzzing in that respect uh, which mm. means that the person who comes in who feels like they have nothing to bring brings everything they are the most important yeah. people they're the most powerful uh, people in that in that whole sort of picture if you see what I'm saying mm. I think that's a really, really interesting idea. And it's something that I can really relate to because um, like I, I've said to you before, when we when we first spoke, um, I deliver my own online course now called Home Recording Academy just for women. Right. And when we're recording this episode, I literally have just finished the live 10 week delivery. Um, and I kind of run it slightly differently, I guess, to a traditional course in that all the women and um you know non male identifying students they get lifetime access to the course mm -hmm. and it's all online but that but there is a very much a kind of live delivery element to it and what i certainly feel is that people will comment in those uh, like live facebook lives and things like that and i will see things that i still relate to it's just that i've become so so tuned out to them mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because I have become so much more practiced at kind of putting those negative narratives to one side or or I've moved on from a time where I was relying on somebody else and therefore was frustrated with that or et cetera, et cetera. And someone will kind of offer that experience or that comment and it will start this whole flurry of conversation, which is so useful mm -hmm. and just as useful for me. You know, and I'm I'm the person who's there holding that space and who's designed the whole six module course but for me it's still really useful because i i benefit from having those conversations still absolutely i i mean i i, I have my whole career within an academic environment and then suddenly the yorkshire sound women network comes along and i have to sit down and pay attention and listen to um listen to experiences that that i could never have so um, listening to people of diverse genders talk about their experiences, but also uh, people of diverse, diverse ethnicities as well. Um, and learning the importance of sitting and just listening um, and, and reflecting hard on what, what, what do you have to do? And that might just be learn. That might be it. That might be all you can do. Uh, make space and learn um yeah and, and pay yeah, attention absolutely. but it's taught it's taught me a lot about um other ways other systems others are wrong word but um ways and systems and, and approaches to doing things which are not um the the typical university hierarchical 
uh, or industry hierarchical yeah, you mm-hmm. know to, to, to i'm trying to avoid saying the word patriarchal because that can turn people <laughs> off but unfortunately yeah. systems have been historically uh set up in those ways so uh that's what, yeah. why i'm fascinated by the diy um mm. approaches because that's tricked that mm-hmm. away but that that's yeah there's a lot to learn about community and what that affords yeah totally so i would love to just talk for a minute about um, the difference or, or the how necessary confidence is with technology because we touched on this when we spoke before and I think it's a really important conversation to have especially for the people who might be listening to this podcast and feeling maybe not c- as confident as they'd like to be because I remember you were talking about was it a study that was was looking at or was it a conversation right. no, you right. had remind me a couple me. of things yeah um, so uh, various academics who who have looked at gender in music technology so that's uh Anna Colley, Davis Hargreaves, uh Vicky Armstrong they've highlighted that uh when girls reach the age of sort of 13 to 16 um they drop away from music technology and we we know that um there's a lot of research that that shows that that you know leaky pipeline um so for example in a uh, Georgie Board and Carl Devine's uh, paper, I think 2015 academic paper, they they did analysis of um, UCAS application forms for from A level music technology courses to 38 degree courses over a 10 year period, and they looked at lots of strands of data, but they also they particularly looked at gender. And whilst there was a 1,400 percent increase in applications, there was those those applications were 90 percent male. Um, so that says a lot. Um, <clears throat> anyway, going back, the education research suggests that that really a lot of this is to do with confidence um, and girls not having the same kind of confidence with as with the technology as boys and the culture uh, associating technology with masculinity and the, and the media and television uh, promoting computers to boys and as boys toys in the home and that sort of thing. Um, and that that's really interesting. But I've I've been looking into this idea of confidence and technology a little bit more through some more recent research in multimodality. So looking at how uh, girls <clears throat> show engagement with technology, not just through touching it, but through looking at it or being curious in other sorts of ways in order to, to create more inclusivity in music technology pedagogy. Um, and in presenting in a, in a sort of online presentation, one of the, one of the delegates suggested that this idea of confidence was a male construct and we shouldn't be trying to um it's a very masculine idea we shouldn't be trying to encourage people to be more confident uh, because actually maybe we should be encouraging this idea of being more exploratory explorative with the equipment and not necessarily being confident but um being able to embrace not having the knowledge not knowing not being in control of everything um, or not portraying that sense of authority um, is, is actually something that we might nurture more through collaboration and creativity together, you know, co-creativity uh, really resonate. This idea really resonates with me. Um, but I think there's, uh, there's something close to that around self-esteem or um, not being held back and I can't put my finger on what the word is if it's not confidence what is it Mm. um but being able to go from looking at a zoom handheld recorder to playing with the buttons on it to getting past the technology into the sound and what you imagine you want to do with that and celebrating that and and encouraging that I feel very passionate about is it something so I mean I I agree I think it's like it's moving away from this sense of confidence and more towards some kind of self-esteem where and I think self-esteem or is it self-efficacy or is it both is it this sense that on the one hand you have the tools to take action and experiment and do things and realize your ideas but on the other hand that if it goes wrong that is not going to be going to totally obliterate your identity as a human right. you know that if you if you make a mistake it doesn't mean that you're a shit human it <laughs> just means that you made a mistake that day right. and also <laughs> it's about whether it goes what well, according to what criteria did it go wrong yeah um 
you know, I, I mean, I, I've become interested in modular since, and every time I, I play with it, it's a new journey. There's no, there's no kind of desired output. My brother had a go. He's he's also uh, got a background in music technology, and the first thing he did was make make a beat in the formal conventional way, and I was impressed that he did that. And then I thought, well, that's not that exciting. I've heard beats before, I, you know, uh, I'm interested in something else. And yeah. there's always somebody interested in in what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, whatever it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. There are so many people out there in the world. It, doesn't, it really doesn't matter what you're doing. Yeah. Somebody's going to be interested and excited about it. Um, that's that's my feeling on mm -hmm. it. And it, 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 by, by definition of your life's uniqueness, your output will be as well. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, trying to separate out confidence and self-esteem and, and, and technology, I think is as, I think it's very much to do with the sort of contract. We what, what one of those articles, one of those articles on girls and education suggested was the teachers felt they maybe this was back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. Maybe they needed to introduce more computers, but it was Vicky Armstrong. She said, actually, no, you don't introduce more computers. You increase a so, uh, you you create a social environment mm. which is more inclusive, and that I think is the the key. <clears throat> to being more inclusive mm. um, is creating those social environments where we assume we, we change our assumptions about what matters. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting that I think, and um, you can see it, you know, what, what you're talking about with Yorkshire Sound Women Network and the other groups that you, you're talking about that have popped up in the last few years. And certainly what I have noticed through my own activity online and the spaces that I'm creating there um, that that sense of community for for women is you know especially it's like you say maybe groups that have been marginalized or have kind of existed on the fringes having that space and having that community where you do feel like you can show up and be um, hopefully not judged and where you can show mm -hmm. up and ask any question and just be you um whatever that means on that day that that there are there is that space and it's that community rather than that confidence that maybe maybe that self-esteem or that confidence or that self-efficacy comes from being part of a community I, I think that is very strengthening for our sense of identity and our self-esteem that we know other people are going through similar things we know other people have had those off days where no, nothing seems to be working it doesn't mean that we are uniquely flawed <clears throat> and you know, right. destined to be always be bad with technology, or you know that we shouldn't even try. For example, I think I think another key part to that is um, when you see people like Paul of Paul of Fairfield, the sound designer for Game of Thrones, out there doing that work at that level. Um, suddenly, there's a feeling of pl it's plausible. Yeah, and and something elusive is stripped away mm, it, mm -hmm. it's somebody like you it becomes plausible I don't know I, I can't pass judgment on that but it is a thing it's something that that is liberates like I used to rock climb so seeing my first time seeing women rock climbing thinking okay well really it isn't just these all these guys doing it you know mm -hmm. all these women are doing it as well and um suddenly it it reduces the barriers, even mm. on that level. And, and something else which I think many people find a little uncomfortable is going into an, an all-women space, particularly um, for the trans community, uh, minority gender people, uh, but for all women on some level, it still requires a lot of trust. You know, yeah. that we, we've, we've had many centuries of particular ways of thinking and doing which we which we have internalized mm -hmm. also um in the way that we see ourselves potentially and the way that women are with each other too yeah uh, that requires a careful curation in terms of setting up all women's spaces and yeah. lots of deep thinking uh careful thought about mm -hmm. that because um because that trust is hard won and easily uh easily broken mm -hmm. um if somebody in that space is, uh, you know, not mindful of that or something clumsy happens. Yeah. And I think it's just worth bearing for, to have that in mind yeah. when working in such space. But also, having said that, to set up spaces which are playful and remove a lot mm -hmm. of these barriers, um, it, it, it can also be very liberating for guys as well. I did, I did a workshop um, at Middlesbrough College several years, years ago 
and uh, a few really remarkable things happened. I did a presentation and I was told there would be one person and student there who, who was going to be extremely resistant to this, uh, this feminist thing that I was doing or that we were doing. Um, and by the end of the day, he wrote a blog post saying that not only was he supportive of what we were doing, but he wanted to actively do something wow. uh, locally as well. Um, but as part of that workshop, we, we had a, a session where people came together and shared their stories. Normally that would be an all women non-binary space, but we, we let um, a sort of 30% of people in. Uh, who were men yeah uh, but because they were a minority in that space they were actually I think for that reason but they were very quiet and, yeah. and they started sharing stories that they'd heard their peers mm -hmm. tell mm -hmm. them and I think there's there's an avenue there for uh, changing the industry yeah. from within education to set up spaces like that where where the people who are normally in the majority and not normally thinking about these mm -hmm. things are faced with them um, up front but those spaces again need careful curation yeah they do absolutely but I, I totally agree I've, I've talked to a lot um, well not I wouldn't say a lot but a, a few guys who are sick of the macho narratives and the expectations and the pressures and the the you know just the expectation that you would know every single piece of equipment by model and year it's been made and released and updated and you know that, that they are sick of this too and that they find it really um inconducive to creativity and um very stifling and um and I know that I know it's not just women who suffer I know that this is something that we all um we all suffer from if we're in those kinds of environments or at least you know a lot of people do anyway um mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, and 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 when I when I actually launched this podcast, just as many men contacted me and mm -hmm. shared it, and you know, rated and reviewed it, and all those things, because they were so happy that this had was out in the world. They were so happy that these conversations mm -hmm. were being had, and I think that lots of men want to have these conversations, and lots of men yeah. want to be able to say. I am not perfect and I don't know right. everything. And oh, that looks nice. Shall we have a play with that for a bit? Mm -hmm. And that's what they want to do too, you know. <laughs> right. Um, so and, and there's and there's plenty actually, not well, maybe not plenty, but there's there's women I've met who have that very kind of macho attitude towards music technology. I, mm -hmm. I have come across them, especially in academia, um, but also mm -hmm. in studios where they have been kind of trained into that same macho, um, almost competitive, but um, very detail orientated, um, very kind of mm. right and wrong um, approach mm. to how you do things. So it's it's definitely not about, you know, what genitals are between your legs only. But I do definitely think there's something about exploring those different sides of ourselves and that to date, it has been very patriarchal and it has been very what we would socially call masculine. I think the social part of that is really important. Yeah. You know, I mean, having become a mum, I've become very aware, and I was before anyway, of, of how children's toys are marketed and what yeah. you see in the supermarket it and uh, the BBC produced a lovely documentary interesting sort of um, social experiment if you like on on gender and toddlers mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah so we're, we're socially conditioned from a very young age into certain ways of being mm -hmm. and, and I think um, yeah it's very hard to unpack that and, and, and address it but it's uh, it would be naive to imagine that doesn't affect a uh, technology dominant industry yeah when you when you look at the gender ratio the, you know you, you can see that something has happened there and that, so yes that there are certain ways of doing things which are the mainstream accept, accepted norm that you know but they're not the only way yeah uh, they yeah. need to be um, yeah just who dominates that space mm. Yeah. And, and just thank you so, so much. It was so interesting. Um, your work is so interesting. I'm really glad that we have connected now and I'd love to stay in touch. Thank you for asking me. I've, I've just had so much fun uh, talking with Good. you, uh, with this conversation and listening to your podcast. And um, it's much needed, very valuable work that you're doing. And uh, I definitely celebrate all of it and, and hope that it changes a lot. 
Well, there is so much that I could have picked Liz's brains about, but I found this conversation about gender and music technology education fascinating. I think Liz brings so many wonderful insights from working in both academia and her experience of creating less formal learning spaces too. If you're struggling with confidence and music tech, there's one thing I'd love you to take from this episode. Don't get bogged down in knowing everything and having the most professional gear right off the bat. Like Liz says, it's more important to experiment and play regardless of where you or your setup are at right now. And to find that community where you can share your ideas and talk about all the exciting things that you can get involved in. And if you hold educational spaces yourself, exploring the idea of community over confidence could be a very interesting way to build stronger, more inclusive learning spaces. And don't forget, you have a female producer spirit guide and she's ready to lead you forward with recording and production. To discover who she is and her magic voodoo ways, just head to femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz. Now, on next week's episode, I'm exploring a topic close to my heart dyslexia and specifically how it might impact upon your abilities in and relationship with music technology. Now I myself have dyslexia and know how much it has affected my spelling, reading and my memory amongst many other things but how might this have impacted upon the way I and maybe you record and produce music? Join me here next time to find out more and take care till then. Just one final thing, dear listener. I just wanted to ask what you thought of today's episode. Did you love it? Did it make you feel emotions and stuff? Did it give you a whole new philosophy on the meaning of life? No? Okay, well, fair enough. But if you liked it at all, just share a teeny weeny review wherever you're listening because, number one, my ego likes a massage and, more importantly, two, I can learn what you're loving and want more of. Oh, and three, it'll boost our ranking in the podcast algorithm, meaning more women and girls will hear all this girls twiddling knobs goodness. Triple win. I can't wait to read your review.